Yeah, we'll just give it a minute for everybody to to join and then um, we'll get started. So the numbers are still going up quite quickly. So thanks to everyone who's joined so far. We'll just give it another 30 seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Great, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So um, welcome to this panel uh, session on testing uh, negative hosted by Harriet, who's a, a genetic counselor. And we have our wonderful panelists, um, Melissa from the US, um, Charlotte from the UK, and also Natalie um, from Canada. Um, so we really appreciate you joining today. Um, and this will be a panel that will begin with um, Harriet, I think, and then the different panelists will be sharing their experiences. And this is really, you know, for you guys um, listening uh, to learn more about it and to ask questions. So there's a Q&A tab at the bottom and we'll go through questions um, at the end or as we go or however it fits in. So I'll, I'll hand over to, I think, Harriet now who, who will start. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Hayley. So hi everybody, thank you for joining us for this panel discussion. So as Hayley was saying, in this session, we're gonna be focusing on the impact of having a predictive test result that shows that you have not inherited the risk of developing Huntington's disease. So first off, I wanna say, when I say predictive tests, some people may know this as pre-symptomatic um, testing, but it's essentially the test that somebody has when they're at risk of HD and they themselves are not showing signs or symptoms of the condition. It's the test that tells you whether you will develop signs and symptoms of the condition in your future. So just that clear definition, it's not a diagnosis of HD that you get after having this type of test. So we don't have a long session today. So between us, we've decided to pick a few key questions uh, for me to ask each of the panelists. And we hope that their answers will sort of highlight some of what testing negative has meant to each of them with the aim that this might be helpful for those still deciding on whether to have predictive testing themselves or for those who have had a negative result already and are still in that process of kind of reflecting and working out exactly what that means to them and to maybe help um, further understand a possible mix of feelings that you may be experiencing. So firstly, just want to introduce myself um, again, but Haley's kind of already done that for me. Um, but I'm one of the genetic counsellors working in the Manchester Centre for Genomic Medicine in the UK. So before I introduce each of our lovely panellists, first I wanted to turn to, you know, what do we mean by testing negative? So this is just going to be a bit of a brief science genetics lesson. Um, many of you will probably already know this, but it, it's just to kind of clarify so we're all on the same page. So as many of you likely already know who are listening, that we all have two copies of the HD gene. Someone with HD, so here in my diagram, it's the man, it's dad. He has a change or an expansion in one of his copies of the HD gene. And we've shown that here in orange. His second copy, shown in white, is of a normal size. So if we just look at dad's partner, they've got two copies of the working gene. Uh, so two copies of a normal size meaning they will not develop Huntington's disease. So each time this couple has a child, they will only pass on one of their copies of the HD gene. The so dad will either pass on his expanded copy of the gene or his normal size copy. And as mum's only got normal sizes, she'll only pass on a normal size copy. 
So every time this couple has a child, there'll be four possible outcomes. They're just coming up now. And more specifically, to break that down, dad, he'll either pass on his copy of the gene with the expansion, and mum will pass on her one of her normal copies. So in this scenario, this outcome would result in somebody having a positive test result, and we would expect them to go on to develop Huntington's disease in their future. The other scenario is that dad passes on his normal size copy, and so does mum. And in this scenario, we would not expect this child to develop HD in their lifetime. And this is the, the outcome that we'll be discussing today. Now, I hope that sort of made sense. I normally check in with people, but obviously we, it's not easy for us to do that in a virtual um, setting. But to just think a little bit more about what we're talking about today. While there's currently no cure for HD, we still find that the majority of people at risk um, choose not to have testing at the moment. The decision to have a test, it's a very personal one with many different reasons driving that decision and many different implications to consider. So for some testing negative for HD, it's an amazing feeling. It's a huge relief for themselves, for those around them, including parents, children, friends. But it's really important to remember that for many, testing negative does not mean that they are completely free of Huntington's disease from their lives. Chances are they still have family members who either have symptoms already, um, are still at risk and haven't had a test, or have actually had testing and they've had the opposite results showing that they're gene positive. So for many, that worry can still remain. So what we hope to kind of highlight today by inviting three um, individuals who've already had testing is some of those implications when you test negative for HD. So I'm kind of going to dive right in now to my panellists. So like I said, each of these individuals has had testing for HD and their results have shown that they have not inherited the expanded gene and they will not develop HD in their lifetime. So firstly, I'm going to turn to Natalie, uh, who's joining us from Canada. So thank you for being here, Natalie. Um, just to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about, about you and your story with HD? Yes, I can. Thank you so much, Harriet. And thank you, everybody who's on this webinar. Um, it's never an easy thing to go through testing. So um, yeah, so brave enough to be here and to learn more about it. Um, so I come from an HD family. Um, my, when I was very young, my grandfather was sick and, uh, I grew up in a house uh, with him being sick. I didn't know him as any other way. Uh, when I was at the end of my teens, early twenties, my mom got diagnosed and that was really the first time I had understood that it was a genetic disease. Like nobody had talked about it in my family. Um, and then at the same time, as we found out that about my mom, I was already taking care of my grandfather for a long time. So I was in his last, his last like seven years of life when he was in long-term care, I was his secondary caregiver to my aunt. And so I did a lot of stuff. I fed him, I took him out, I monitored his doctor stuff. So I kind of had an idea of, of what I was in for. Um, <laughs> the only thing that was different is that I did never had seen someone go from well to unwell in that. So that was a bit different. Um, so that was a struggle with my mom. And then, so I was her primary caregiver uh, around that 2021, she started to get sicker. We started to kind of switch roles and I had a really hard time adjusting to being a caregiver at that time. I was pretty angry at the situation. I was kind of at that moment, I wasn't receiving a lot of help from my other family members. So there was a lot of resentment and there was a lot of turmoil internally. And then I started to really uh, kind of freak out about the fact that I was at risk. So not only was I <laughs> caregiving every day and kind of doing all these different things, but I was living at risk. So anytime I dropped a pen, anytime my body twitched, anytime something happened, I would go, oh, is this starting? Is this starting? So um, it took a really long time. It took almost um, eight years 
to make the decision to have my test done. Um, I didn't take it lightly because I knew that it's like red pilling yourself. Once you know, you can't unknow it. And the implications at that time, at least in Canada where I am, were very severe in terms of we didn't have genetic protections. We didn't have anything legislatively that was going to, you know, I was worried about insurance. I was worried about employment. I was worried about being able to own a home. So there was a lot of other things outside of my, um, of my like personal reservations, whereas more like I had professional reservations as well. So that's like, you know, when you're considering all that, you, you really want to sit back and go, well, what are the implications of a positive test? Because at that time I had no, I, I never thought I was going to test negative. It just wasn't even in my consciousness. So I was planning for a positive test and planning all the stuff I was going to do. Um, and to, to put like more fuel to the fire at the time, I was also dealing with um, chronic physical pain. I was in a car accident a couple of months after my mom was diagnosed that left me in chronic pain. So I was doing a lot of soul searching and a lot of healing uh, with yoga, yoga therapy, um, learning everything I could about wellness to see if I could stave off, <laughs> uh, thanks Jack, uh, stave off um, any sort of symptoms or keep myself healthy long enough to be able to, um, you know, live a better quality of life. So that's kind of uh, my story in a nutshell. Um, I was a reluctant person to get tested. Um, I did have to wait a year to get my results once I went for my test because I was still um, at the later stages of caregiving and my mom was going to long-term care. So I couldn't get my results until she was taken care of. So it's like, I had to put a lot of my life on hold um, to make that decision. Cause I wanted to have a little bit more, um, I wanted to just know so that I could make decisions a little bit clearer. Thanks Natalie. And I know we're gonna to touch on some of the points you've raised there um, a little bit later on as well and so now let's turn to Charlie uh, who's joining us from the UK. Charlie, Hi everybody. Can, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. So um, again my name is Charlie it's coming up as Charlotte for some reason <laughs> don't really last. Um, so yeah um, I'm 27 years old I live in Cardiff in the UK um, I started UMI and HD after the diagnosis of my dad in March 2019. During that time, he found out two days before I gave birth to my son that he had Huntington's disease. Um, so when I was pregnant, I didn't know that my dad was at risk. Um, I didn't know what it meant for me. I didn't know what it meant for my family when he when we sat down and had the conversation. And I was already pregnant. So bless my parents. I think a lot of it was to just keep you know what could be what could happen away from me and just for me to focus on a normal pregnancy um like I said my dad found out two days before I gave birth to my son however he didn't tell me until about three months after I had had my son and he sat us all down and explained the situation and yeah I had just come from a very traumatic birth um I was a first-time mum I didn't know what to even think all I just knew was I needed to feed my son at that point and I needed to just carry on um, and I think for me it was about trying to find someone who was in the same situation as me so I could make that decision I think as soon as you have a child you understand that everything you do is for them you don't even give yourself a second thought and I think for me it wasn't until after my son's first birthday that I actually thought to myself no I, I am going to do it um, there wasn't there was a lot of times that I would be searching the internet and things like that for answers as, as to how to do it and I kind of just took the ball by the horn really and kind of went full throttle into it and thought to myself if I'm going to do this I want people to know what this is like and I want people to have that support and know that this is a real thing and the genetic testing process can be just as traumatic um, I was part of a recent documentary for BBC Two in the UK with Stacey Dooley um, talking about DNA family secrets and in November last year they followed me throughout the whole year with my genetic testing um, appointments and I found out that I tested negative so yeah so it was um, a mixed bag of feelings but yeah that's pretty much my story up till now. Thanks Charlie and just go on to Melissa um, who's joining us from the US um, can you tell us a little bit about your story? 
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa and uh, I'm from the States, the US, um, originally Ohio area. And um, my mom was the first in my family to be diagnosed with Huntington's. Um, she became symptomatic shortly after I was born um, and my parents were divorced. So um, just as a child starting to notice strange behaviors, um, the outbursts that were really out of character, um, and so we were in the process of losing our house and I was eight years old, uh, when my mom was officially diagnosed. Um, and basically her siblings, my aunts and uncles started to notice that she acted a lot like their grandfather, um, in his later years and, you know, thought he was just a drunk, um, but realized that there might be something more at play. So she was diagnosed when I was eight. Um, and I kind of started to take on a caregiving role, uh, both for her and my brother. Um, and I don't know if, um, I know someone told me she had Huntington's and I knew that that was the name for it. And I was like, cool, that's what it is. I don't know if someone really told me that I had a 50, 50 chance. Um, I just, ever since they said my mom had HD, I went and I do too. Um, because that just made sense. I was just like my mom in every single way and, um, absolutely idolized her and, um, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> Um, and so it was never a question to me. Um, I didn't quite have like Google and stuff and, you know, elementary school and things like that, but I think grade school is the first time I looked up like the scientific definition of Huntington's. So that way I had something to ramble off to people to tell them like what my mom had. Um, and then after high school, Google was more of a thing. And, um, I found out that the cost of testing was pricey and I didn't have health insurance. Um, and for me, I didn't um, think that, oops, sorry, something popped up on my computer. Um, I didn't like need to get tested because I just knew I had it. Like I knew I had it, it was never a question. And um, so I was um, in like on a community health plan with a local hospital in my twenties. And my doctor had mentioned that um, I could get that genetic test done and it would cost nothing out of pocket. So I'm like, all right, let's do it. Um, had no idea about getting any type of insurances in place or as much as I like knew I had it, I wasn't like worried about any future planning. I just didn't care or I was just more ignorant to it. Um, so, um, about a week before my 24th birthday, my geneticist called me with, um, an early birthday gift um, to tell me that I was gene negative. And, um, that was, uh, that was, that was tough to process. So, um, other than that, I have of my mom's siblings, um, most of them are gene positive, um, early symptoms. And then I also, um, have three siblings that are all gene positive and two in early symptoms. So out of me and my siblings, I'm the only one that's gene negative and everybody else has it. Thank you, Melissa. And, you know, you're, you're starting there, aren't you, to highlight the complexity of this testing and the, this testing negative and some people presenting it like a, a gift or, or a good news um, without thinking about the, the broader impact of that. Now, we, we did say at the beginning, you know, this is a relatively short session for the nature of the topic that we're talking about today. Um, so we're, we're, we'll carry on with our questions and answers, um, but it might be that we're not able to cover everything, you know, in detail, um, but we're all very passionate about this topic. So we'll hopefully be able to pick this conversation up um, at a later time or through the support services that you can see on the screen. Um, so without further ado, sort of going back to Natalie, um, to start with, can you tell us one of the good things um, that you experienced when you were told that you tested negative for HD? Um, well, I had a support team that was kind of carrying me through that last year. So I had to um, support people in my, um, when they gave me my results, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you made me like, <laughs> I wanted to hug you so bad when you were talking. Um, um, and I just like felt like the relief in there, in them. And uh, I remember looking up because the genetic, she pulled out my paper and she was like showing me and I just like 
wasn't really conscious and she was like oh <laughs> uh your your number is 18 and she's like you're normal and I was like well first of all no one's ever called me normal before and <laughs> secondly I was like could you just read that again can you just say that out loud and then she read it again and like my we they were crying and I was just like floored because um I was like well <laughs> Uh, now I know one thing that's not going to kill me. <laughs> I knew one thing that wasn't going to get me. It could be cancer, it could be this, but it was like, I could rule out one possibility of a future that had kind of been like weighing on me for a decade. Like it's a long time to kind of carry that around. Um, but I wasn't happy. That was a weird thing. Like I felt in like a relief and they were happy. And then I realized like, I was like, why don't I feel happy? Like, I just didn't understand what the feeling was. Um, and it took me a while. Like, I didn't know what survivor's guilt was. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that happens. And so until my first conference um, that I went to and someone talked about it, I think it's actually in Melissa's <laughs> um, when I went to Chicago. Uh, I, I didn't know it was a thing. So I just was like, oh, and I really didn't keep, I really didn't talk about it a lot because I didn't tell a lot of people I was getting tested. I kept it very quiet. I didn't want to have to tell people my results. Um, so I was very private about it. So I just kind of sat with it for a year. And anytime I had a twitch or I dropped something and I would pull out my paper and be like, oh, it's not that. <laughs> it's not that. I'm just a spaz, maybe. It's not that. So that's a little bit about my positives. Thank you. And you, you highlighted that, you know, it's that result means a lot to those support people around you as well. It, it's as we all know with HD, it's a family thing, isn't it? And that result not only impacts you, but that was an impact on those who were there in the room with you. And Charlie, can you name one of the one of the good of things? Mm. Um, so, yeah, um, like I said before, we were filmed when I got my results and um, the link you can see is on the helpful website so with BBC Two. Um, I think it was just looking at my son and being able to have him in the room because we were being filmed. I was quite lucky that during the COVID um, pandemic, I was allowed to have my partner and my son in the room with me. And I think just looking at him and knowing he was okay, I don't think I even processed what it meant for me. And I then realised that I could give him 100% of me, what I really struggled with was when I found out that he was at risk after having him I really tried not to love him and that was only out of the fact that I knew I couldn't protect him and I was scared to lose this little bundle that I'd just been given um, and yeah and I think for me um, having that moment documented was so people could understand and that is the best thing that's come out of this for me and um, finally also there's um, my myself my mum and um, my two brothers for my mum not being obviously um, positive not having the gene complexities like my dad um, knowing that whatever happened with my brothers I could be there for her and support her with whatever happens in our future really thank you Charlie and you, you touched on something such as so powerful you know about your son how you hadn't been quite feeling yourself and not able to quite let go um without knowing what your test result was going to be and that's that's a really um brave thing to bring here for us all and turning to Melissa um if you can tell us one of the good things but I know that this is you know quite a complex question um and I wonder if we, I might <laughs> jiggle our order around a little bit. If you tell us one of the good things about re receiving this result, but then if you go on to explain a little bit about why that was um, a complex result for you. Okay. Um, yeah, thinking about um, what was one of the uh, good things that came out of it, um, I had to think for an answer um, and which sounds terrible in a way, you know, I think there's the, there's the, of course, you know, obviously with my line, like Huntington stops. I, if I have kids, I can't pass it down. And, you know, that's always a plus. Um, I think simultaneously the best and the worst feeling I experienced was the 10 minutes after that phone call that I felt um, relief. 
and I don't like that um, because shortly after I had like called like my brother to tell him like, oh, hey, you know, um, I, I got my results and I'm negative. And he, he said to me, he's like, oh, okay, well now it's my turn to get tested. And I don't know why, but like my one brother specifically, I never even put him in the at-risk category. It literally was not even on my mind. It was like, I have it. And at the time, like my, one of my oldest half siblings was already gene positive. And I was like, I have it. And then that's it. Nobody else has it. Um, and that's when it like hit me. Um, and so that led to the positive of that's what push, pushed me to go to my first support group. And then that's how I got involved with the Huntington's Disease Society of America and became involved in the National Youth Alliance. And I was on the board for the NYA for six years and went to conventions and everything. And so all of that has definitely been, um, been a plus. Um, I think uh, um, the session that Natalie talked about coming to, Marianne and I spoke at, and that was like our first session that we did about survivor's guilt. And uh, I think the problem with it is, is that no one really talks about it. Yeah, and I think every, for most people I've talked to who test gene negative feel guilty for feeling guilty. Um, and not everybody, some people, you know, test gene negative, they get that relief and they kind of move on with their lives. And depending on if they have people in their family that are still affected or sick or not, um, you know, and, and, you know, that's the path for, for depending on who, where your life takes you. Um, but I feel guilty for be, feeling guilty and guilty for talking about it and taking up time. Cause it's like, I don't have, I don't have Huntington's like, why are we wasting time talking about me and my feelings? Um, but it's definitely something important to touch on because I think there's like, you know, it looks like a cute little box and it says survivor's guilt. And it's like, what is that? Um, and the geneticist like mentioned that to me and it, in one ear, not the other. Cause I was like, I, I have Huntington's. Okay, whatever. So I don't know if anything could have like prepared me for my result, um, but it's um, it's definitely difficult with like my siblings. Um, it's a lifelong experience. I think I've experienced a very wide range of survivor's guilt feelings um, from one end to the other, um, all at different points in my life. Um, specifically now I'm starting the process of caregiving for one of my siblings and my other sibling um, is early symptoms, um, but is married with kids, has a good support system. Um, and then there's one sibling left that I'm definitely gonna be a caregiver for. Um, and I'm also dating someone who is at risk. And so I couldn't get enough of it clearly, um, but uh, it's definitely affecting um, thinking about our like life decisions and you know, where we're going to settle and what's best for everybody, but also best for us. Um, and I think the hardest thing is like, the one thing I would want my siblings um, to know, I saw someone mention this in the Q&A, um, is that like, I don't, I know my siblings, the ones that I'm going to take care of feel bad that it falls on my shoulders. And I don't want them to feel that way. As awful and crappy as I feel about being the gene negative one, like, thank God one of us is and it's me and I can handle it. I think I can, <laughs> um, but um, the biggest question is why not me? Why can't I take it from them? Like, why can't I take this from everyone? And it's just, I will, I'll, I'll do anything for my siblings, of course, but it makes life look a little different. And so there's different aspects of grief and loss within that. And then also, like pre-anticipatory grief about like losing my siblings um, and what that process is going to look like and what will I lose within my own life because I need to prioritize kind of what I'm doing and who I'm taking care of, where I'm going to live and all of that. So all that messy crap is all like stuffed into this like box and it's not cute and it's not pretty and um, it sucks. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And, and as ever, you know, touching on so many important points, you're saying that, you know, why, why are we talking about me? But I think within that same, you just talking there, you kind of gave us the reasons for why it's so important that we do talk to those who've tested negative. 
and why it is important that we have these spaces um, and things like the wonderful HDEO conference and other spaces at other um, events that are carried out within the HD community because it's that case of you're just one person I guess in a big family and it's a family condition it's a family disease and your test result doesn't take away the other side of the condition and it doesn't change anything does it which is the difficult thing about the HD gene and how it's inherited that your result in terms of inheritance risk has no impact on those risks to your siblings and it is it's the all the other stuff that goes along with it that is so important for us to speak about now Hayley I, I can see the time so I'm not sure what you would like us to do at this stage yeah I think we can answer a couple of the questions I know uh thank you guys who've already been typing um your answers um to them I think one of the ones was about siblings um, and I think Natalie and Melissa have typed their answers um Melissa said um yeah she's she's one of uh, four and her other three siblings have tested uh, positive uh, I don't think everyone can see once they've been answered in chat so I'm just reading out the responses and and Natalie you mentioned it I think you said you had two brothers and they they've chosen not to be tested yet at, at least um and so Charlie I just wondered if you wanted to answer if you had any siblings yeah so I've got two brothers I've got one who is in a relationship the other one is nearly 10 and 21 so it's fair to say that they're in the points of their lives where you know one of them can decide but the other one you know um if he decides to do it or not do it it's it's all in their hands and I think that's the way we've kind of dealt with it I think the difference between um, Melissa um, Natalie and me is uh, they obviously knew quite early on in their um, journey that there was a risk whereas with um, myself it came virtually out of the blue so I think they're just pretty much still in the midst of deciding what they're going to do. Yeah that's great thank you Charlie and um, we have another question that Natalie um, has has answered as well and um, I know Melissa's briefly touched on this but please feel free to also give your uh, response um, Melissa so somebody asked what what are you guys doing now and Natalie said uh, she's currently a yoga teacher and a therapist and you're still caregiving for your mom and your your aunt and um, very active in the Canadian HD community so I'll just put that over to Charlie and then and then maybe Melissa. Yeah so um, I still do Yumi and HD um, I oh, I was volunteering it's now a job I work as a social media officer for um, a young carers charity based in Oxfordshire um, and yeah, I, I just want to point out, even with my negative result, I think a lot of people thought I would just put it on the shelf and just leave it and get on with my life. But I think it's extremely important for all of us that have been on this panel. We've all sat in that room. We've all had those results. and We've all kind of have thought about what it would be like if we were to test positive. And I think the work does carry on. The work needs to carry on because unfortunately where people test positive, positive and their voices then are no longer heard at some point in their lives we can carry on and hopefully um, support more people and um, get them through what they need to go through at the time. No thank you Charlie I don't know if you wanted to add anything Melissa. Um, so sorry I was trying to answer a quick question. Um, oh no, that's okay don't worry. <laughs> um, which question am I answering right now? Um, just what what are you doing now? I know you mentioned about your siblings who you might be um, a caregiver for, but I just, I guess more in general, um, the question is what, what are you gonna do now maybe? I'm, I am not good at um, putting myself before others and taking care of my needs, um, which is the ultimate, I mean, I've been preaching that to every caregiver I've met in the community. And so, you know, sometimes you gotta eat your own words. Um, so my partner is just absolutely amazing and super supportive and um, trying to work on my schedule and carving out me time. Um, Cause currently we relocated my brother and he's living in his own apartment down the road, um, but doesn't drive and then, and needs that social interaction. So it's like one night a week, we're taking turns, picking him up to bring him over for dinner. Um, I take him to doctor's appointments. Um, and he was recently hit by a car while walking. And so now we have like lots of appointments. Um, 
and then also trying to just, you know, get the bankruptcy done and file for disability and all those things. Um, and I had a bit of a mental health meltdown actually just last week. So um, my partner told me that, you know, it's time to prioritize. Like I need a chunk of time in a day where I can like take my dog to the park and do my thing for me. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm focusing on now, just to try to make sure as long as I'm taken care of, others will be taken care of. Oh, definitely, I think that's really good advice. Thank you, Melissa. And there's just um, maybe two more questions, if that's okay with you, Harriet, as well, and everybody. Um, so I guess, so Natalie has answered this question in text, but the question was, um, did you plan the timing uh, of testing yourself and how important do you think uh, the right timing is? I know we've had a variety of different um, times where people have waited a longer time, people have waited a shorter time, but I guess, how do you feel how important the timing is? I think for me personally, ha um, already having a son, um, I found it really, really difficult to kind of accept that I would have to wait until he was 18 to find out if he had Huntington's or not or if he started showing symptoms, then I would know. So for me, I wanted it done sooner rather than later because I didn't want to waste time. I didn't want to waste the bond that I would be have worrying about him for years and years to come when I could have taken the chance to find out if he was at risk or not. Um, I think as well, purely because we were part of the documentary, we were almost not fast track, fast track isn't the right word to say, but we were almost kind of, I had to be very definite that this is what I wanted to do and see it the whole way out. And obviously due to filming and that it was done more in a shorter space of time. Um, we still had the bits in between, but yeah, that was, that was pretty much it for me. Um, I just wanted to know short and sweet because of um, Kian. Yeah, for me, I was um, already going to school and um, kind of in the major of like what my career was going to be. I didn't have any major, major money making decisions at the time. It wasn't like, should I go back to school or not? Like, I'm not going to go back if I have Huntington's and, you know, or it wasn't like, you know, am I going to get married and have kids or not? Um, so there wasn't anything that pushed it. I just knew that well, I always knew I had it and didn't feel like I maybe even needed the test, um, but the opportunity just came up to like not have to pay out of pocket. So I was like, well, why not? Let's get it over with. Um, so that was basically the, the timing for me. Um, but I do wish I would have been more um, rigid about how I wanted my appointment to go. Um, getting my results over the phone was actually really, really difficult. Um, and I had planned for like two of my siblings to be there with me for the appointment. Um, so I wish that 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 would have panned out a bit differently and um also not been such a presented as such a gift so <laughs> and um I, I hope you don't mind me asking melissa um have you given that feedback to the the clinic or the the person who gave you that if that's something you're able to do yeah um the my genetic counselor was actually at one of my the first sessions i spoke on um about testing negative and so there I was. okay yeah so we did have a conversation after the fact and um they just at, when we started talking more about this and having genetic counselors in the room especially um a lot of you know or even doctors or just any professional sometimes they just don't see or know what that weight is that comes with testing negative um, so I think that just like with Huntington's, the more education and advocacy we do, the more that people know. And so on this time, on this frame of reference, um, you know, the more that we talk about it, the more that like professionals can be in a better position to support us regardless of our results. No, definitely. Thank you for that, Melissa, because that's something that's, I just asked because that's something that's come up at other conferences and we've, I think it's always important, you know, obviously that, you know, that was very difficult um what happened and hopefully people have, people will learn from that so that people don't go through the same experience again and, and we've heard from people who've maybe tested positive but the news hasn't been given in a a caring way maybe which hopefully people will learn people will learn from that as well um can and i maybe, jump in Haley? of course of course because okay. <laughs> like what melissa is saying it's so important for the health professionals to learn from communities and the awareness of things like survivor's guilt have really been increasing over the years. Um, and I can only speak for the UK, but um, we follow very clear guidelines on the testing process. 
and we would make a solid plan with whoever was having testing in advance of their result appointment and we wouldn't change that plan so if something happened in someone's life meaning they didn't want that result anymore obviously that's one thing um, but if we say I'm going to give you the result on this day at this time we would very much stick to that um, and I think that's come from things like Melissa's situation where we wouldn't just call somebody out of the blue because what we might perceive as a good news is not how the person on the other end may perceive it and that's why it's so important to be um, clear about the plans and the processes of giving results. Yeah, I want to quickly add, um, so my genetic counselor was the same person that tested my sibling right after me. So it also was a giveaway that I knew that, well, if my brother's negative, we're going to get a phone call. Um, but that was not the case. And um, he lived out of state even. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, that would have been more convenient, but we had to like go to a center near him to be able to get his results read. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, exactly. that's a very good point. Um, and maybe just the, the final question, then I'll just ask if there's anything else anyone wants to add. Um, so we'd had some questions um, from how can we get support um, with survivors guilt? Who can we talk to? And I know there's been a few responses in the in the text. Thank you. Uh, but I don't know if other people can see it once it's been answered. So um, the guys have all said you can you can see some links on the screen. HDO, of course, always here. You can email us at info at hdo.org um and of course uh i don't know if any, harriet if you wanted to add anything else to that sorry i've done that thing where i was looking at another <laughs> question <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> Um, sorry, what were you asking? No, I was just saying that um, I think because you've replied in chat, I'm not sure if everyone can see that, but um, if anyone is uh, wanting more support on this issue, obviously HDO are here, but there's also the links on screen. Uh, did yeah. you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, um, I guess it's wherever you had your test, I would uh, encourage you to go back to wherever you had your test and whoever you met during that process. Um, you're very much... I, I guess it's everywhere, but you know, very much in the UK, you're very much, we don't close that file or, or close that door. Um, so you just get back in touch with whoever you had the testing with and you're entitled to have another a follow up appointment. Um, appointments with geneticists and genetic counsellors do not have to be just if you want testing um, or just if you've tested positive. Um, it's an environment to explore the pros and cons and, and you might decide actually this isn't for me. Um, so it, it's use those services and they're there for all aspects of this. No, definitely. Harriet, can I, um, can I just uh, mention a couple things that I think are um, relevant? Um, around the timing question, should I get tested? And you're thinking about this, somebody put in a question in the panel of they, should they complete their studies? Uh, if you think that that result's going to interfere with the work that you're currently doing and you have like, you know, six months that so you're still on the project, then I would just finish what you're doing and then make the time for yourself to cope with that answer because you don't know what it's going to be like after you know. So it's like, I would recommend anybody that's going through testing, like take a couple days off, like schedule in advance a couple days off after like you have your testing date and you know when your results are coming in take a couple days off and tell and communicate with the people that you trust the most and who have your best interests. Like don't tell strangers or people in passing. I know it's really popular in this community, not in this community, but people outside to just say, have you been checked yet? Oh, you're someone has Huntington disease and they want to know for their own curiosity. I, I still, after testing negative, I do not respond to questions like that from outside people outside of our community because I find it, it's my genetic information. And if I want to share it with you, that's my privilege to share it with you, not as an obligation or as um, somebody else's curiosity so they can decide how they want to treat you. Are they going to give you the, the pity face or are they going to, are you going to change your behavior towards me? Like, if you're going to like me, you're going to like me, whether I'm positive or negative. <laughs> and that's the way that I play it. Cause it's like, it's one part of your story. It's not the whole entire thing. What's in your genes is not who you are, who you are is a complex thing. So don't let it take your identity 
And if you have things that you want to accomplish, just do them. Do all the things you want to accomplish. Hayley, if I can just answer it on terms of a perinatal side of things. Obviously, um, for some people, they don't have the time to, to stop in terms of when you've got a baby, you've just got to keep going, even if you don't want to keep going or not. And I just want to say in terms of that survivor's guilt, when you mix that in with the baby blues that then don't turn into baby blues, they are postnatal depression and things like that. It is incredibly important that you are letting your health professionals know that you're going through that because especially in the UK within that, with whilst you're pregnant and also with that the first year, the amount of support that is given to you is probably the most you'll get in your entire life. You won't have to wait months and months to be um, seen by a counsellor and things like that. And you can be seen by a counsellor that's appropriate for what you're going through. I found it extremely difficult when I was pregnant going to post um, prenatal support groups and then not knowing what Huntington's was, not knowing what I was going through. So having that as well and then afterwards mixed with the Huntington supporters Harriet's already mentioned I was I was referred straight away virtually years to right you've tested negative however we know that you'll probably still need support this is what's on your doorstep this is what's in Cardiff and I know that's the same in Oxford that's the same in a lot of hub places um, where the Huntington's testing thing is and I think it's just an important thing just to get out there that sometimes we don't have the opportunity to just stop and carry on with our lives unfortunately we have to crack on with it and being a parent is an extremely fragile time in itself and just make sure you're taking care of yourself and seeking that help no, thank you charlie um and thank you also uh, natalie and charlie for picking up that question i missed it went straight to answered so i didn't see it thank you for that so I think we'll probably, um, if it's okay with everybody, bring the session to to a close here. But I would just like to say to all the participants and all the and spe the speakers as well that obviously this isn't the end. If you want if you want some more help and support and you want to reach out, please please do so to any of the links there, but particularly HDO. Um, you know we're we're all here for you. You know positive, negative, at risk. You know you you'll always have a place in the community with us. Um. Teresa did ask one question that I'll follow up afterwards with the participants because she was asking to maybe get in touch. So I'll, I'll follow up via email after that. But I just want to say, Ed and uh, Harriet, you can join me as well. But uh, thank you so much, all of you, for for being brave and courageous to share your stories. I know it'll really help people. And I know it's I know it's difficult to to, to talk about, especially with with an audience. But um, it is very much appreciated. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Harriet. Just mirror that. Thank you, all three of you, um, for joining us. It's it's like we were saying, it's such an important conversation. Um, we don't want the testing negative um, individuals to feel outside of the community. And I know you three yourselves are doing so much work on making sure that is not the case. And we hope to continue to mirror that in, from the health professional side. And it's it's been a really great session to be involved in so thank you for also having me um here for this and then you've just reminded me i need to tell you what's on next so i'll be two seconds telling you what's on next so <laughs> um we've already run over but that's okay we would have had ptc on track one so maybe you can catch the end of that one um we also have the test and positive panel still ongoing if anyone wants to jump over to that one and as the wonderful natalie has just said in our 30 minute break, we'll be having yoga with Natalie. So make sure you join that. I think after a day of sat at your computer um, or wherever you are, we need some relaxation. And we had some wonderful dancing yesterday as well. So please join uh, Natalie's yoga session. So thank, thank you, you so all. much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.